Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A-Level, Chemistry Unit 2 for June 2022. This is the part 2 video. I already did the part 1 video and I'll put the link below the description box. June 15 says this question is about calcium carbonate. This is calcium carbonate and this is calcium carbonate decomposes on heating. That is the equation for the thermal decomposition of calcium carbonate. This explains why calcium carbonate decomposes at high temperature than magnesium carbonate in terms of the charge and the size of the cation. So I have my description here. So this is the calcium carbonate and that is the magnesium carbonate. We know that magnesium has a smaller radius in comparison to calcium. So it means this is going to have a higher charge density, meaning it's going to distort the electron cloud or the oxygen more, causing a weakening of this bond. So since this bond is weaker, it means less energy is going to be needed in order for the bond to break in comparison to calcium here. Calcium has a lower charge density. It is not going to distort the electron cloud around this oxygen, and therefore that bond is not going to be so weakened. So to decompose calcium carbonate, you will need to input more energy in comparison to magnesium carbonate. So here I say the ionic radius of calcium 2 plus is larger than that of magnesium 2 plus, yet they both have the same charge. So since magnesium has a greater charge density, it causes greater polarization of the oxygen it is attached to, and this weakens the carbon-oxygen bond of the carbonate ion, I mean the carbon-oxygen single bond, not the double bond, making it easily broken so lower energy is required to decompose magnesium than calcium carbonate. So that will be it. I'm going to continue. Here they say calcium carbonate reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid. Again, they've given you the equation for the reaction. This a student determines the initial rate of this reaction by collecting the carbon dioxide in a gas syringe and measuring the volume at regular intervals. They say the gas syringe can measure a maximum of 100 centimeters cubed of gas, calculate the maximum volume of 0.5 mol per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid that can be added to excess calcium carbonate at room temperature and pressure without exceeding the measurable volume of the gas syringe. So it means the maximum volume should be 100 centimeters cubed because that is the volume of the gas syringe. So if we are not to exceed, I went with the maximum volume of 100. So I said volume of CO2 should be 100 centimeters cubed. And since I know the volume, I can calculate the number of moles since the, the experiment was carried out at room temperature and pressure. So number of moles of carbon dioxide should be the volume of gas, which is volume of carbon dioxide divided by the molar volume. I used in centimeters cubed since this is also centimeters cubed. And I got my number of moles of the CO2 that can be produced to be 4.1667 times 10 power negative 3 mole. Now, since I know these moles, I went on to find the number of moles of HCl. I'm going to use the mole ratio 1 to 2. So the moles of HCl should be 2 times the moles of carbon dioxide, which is 8.333 times 10 power negative 3 mole. And finally, the volume of HCl should be number of moles divided by concentration, which is 8.333 times 10 power negative 3 divided by 0 0.5, and I get 0 0.01667, but this is decimeters cubed. To convert that to centimeters cubed, I got 16.7, because I had to multiply by 1,000, so the answer was 16.7. Moving on, here they say the results of the student's experiment were shown on a graph. So that is a graph we see the volume of carbon dioxide on the paddock axis and the time on the horizontal axis. They say calculate the initial rate of reaction and then you must show you're working on the graph and include units in your answer. So when they say the initial rate, it means I have to draw a tangent at time is equal to zero and then find the gradient of that tangent. That is what I did. I had to draw a tangent at t is equal to zero. As you can see, that is the tangent. Time is equal to zero. And find the change in the vertical axis, which is the change in the volume of carbon dioxide. The change in the horizontal axis is going to be the change in time, and that is going to give us the initial rate. So. As you can see here, my vertical change is uh, from 100 to 0, which is 100. And the horizontal change is from 0 to 360. Uh, I use the wider part of the tangent. So here I got um, 100 over 360, which gave me 0 0.27778 centimeters cubed per second. Down here they say the student repeats the experiment but chooses hydrochloric acid with a concentration of 0 0.250 mol per decimeter cubed. They say all other variables are kept the same said what would happen to the initial rate of reaction and the final volume of carbon dioxide collected. We would expect the rate of reaction to be half because this concentration is half or lower 
than the initial concentration they used, which was 0 0.5 mol per decimeter cubed, as we saw previously. So the initial rate is expected to be lower since we have mole from 0 0.5 to 0 0.25 mol per decimeter cubed. And then the final volume of carbon dioxide collected within that same time, we expect the final volume of CO2 collected to be less in comparison to the one that was produced at 0 0.5 mol per decimeter cubed. So this brings us to the end of question 15. Let us continue to question 16. Question 16, this question is about the halogens and some of their compounds. They say descending the group from fluorine to iodine, the electronegativity of the atoms decrease even though their nuclear charge increases. They want you to explain the trend in electronegativity. The first thing we need to know what electronegativity is. If one of the atoms in a covalent bond attracts both electrons in that bond to itself, that is a more electronegative atom in that bond. As you go down the group, of course, from fluorine to iodine, we see the number of shells are going to be more, and therefore the atomic radius is going to be bigger. So I say down the group, more shells are added, even though the nuclear charge increases. We know nuclear charge increases because the number of protons are increasing. The atomic radius also increases. So even though the attraction from the nucleus increases, atomic radius will increase because of the shielding. So I say due to shielding by inner shell electrons, there is less attraction for bonding electrons by the nucleus of the atom. So uh, the bonding electrons have to be attracted by the nucleus. If there is a lot of shells, there is a lot of shielding towards the electrons in the bond, so they will not be attracted, and therefore that is going to lower the electronegativity. The next part says iodide 5, which is this one, reacts with iodide ions in acid solution. They've given us the equation for the reaction as that. They say explain in terms of the oxidation numbers of iodine in three species why this is not a disproportionation reaction. If a reaction is to be called a disproportionation reaction, it means one species is going to be oxidized as well as uh, reduced on the other side. So the product side should have two different species. If it's iodine this side, the other side we should have two different oxidation states of iodine. However, this is not the case here. Here we have plus five oxidation state at the reactant side and minus one oxidation state at the reactant side. We only have zero oxidation state at the product side, so this is not a disproportionation reaction. So I say, in this equation, iodine exists in three oxidation states. There is iodate in plus five, iodide in minus one, and iodine in zero. And this is not a disproportionation reaction because the product is only one oxidation state, which is iodine, so that is not a disproportionation. The next they ask, hydrogen bromide and hydrogen iodide reduce sulfuric acid. Identify by name of formula the compound produced containing sulfur with its lowest oxidation state in the reaction. So when a B hydrogen bromide is used, uh, the sulfur in sulfuric acid is converted into sulfur in sulfur dioxide, and the change in oxidation state is plus 6 to plus 4. So the lowest for this case, because it's only one sulfur product, is going to be that. However, with hydrogen iodide, we can see there are three sulfur-containing products, which is sulfur dioxide, sulfur, as well as hydrogen sulfide. In hydrogen sulfide, the sulfur is oxidation state minus 2. Here it's 0, and there it's plus 4. So I wrote the ones that have the lowest oxidation state per reaction, so which is that, as well as that. So those were the answers there. Next, they say the graph shows the boiling temperatures of the hydrogen halides. So here we have, of course, hydrogen fluoride and then the others in increasing order, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, and hydrogen iodide. Here they say explain the trend in boiling temperatures of the hydrogen halides. So, of course, I began by talking about the forces of attraction that exist among them. So I said all the hydrogen halides have London forces and permanent dipole interactions. However, the strength of the London forces among the hydrogen halides increase as the number of electrons increases. So if we're just talking about London forces, this is going to have the greatest London forces, that one, then next, then that, then that. So this will have the least London forces and that will have the most London forces. So the only difference or the only reason as to why this one has a very high boiling point is because it forms intermolecular hydrogen bonds and the others do not. So I went on here to explain and I said the strength in London forces among the hydrogen halides increases as the number of electrons increase. So the boiling temperature increases and this explains the increase in boiling temperature from hydrogen chloride to hydrogen iodide. However, in hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen bonding also exists between the molecules and hydrogen bonding is stronger than London forces and the dipo dipole interaction. Hence, hydrogen fluoride has the highest boiling point. So this explains everything going on. 
Next here they say a sample of seaweed was evaporated to dryness. The solid residue was weighed, then dissolved completely in the ionized water. Excess aqueous silver nitrate was added to the solution. All the chloride and in the seawater formed the precipitate of silver chloride. So this is the reaction for that. And they say the precipitate was filtered, washed and dried and weighed. So the mass of uh, solid residue from seawater was that. The mass of silver chloride from the precipitate was that. They want us to calculate the percentage by mass of chloride ions in the solid residue. So here I began by finding the number of moles of silver chloride. Since I knew the mass of the precipitate, which is silver chloride, I used the mass, um, the mass of silver chloride, which is that divided by the molar mass. And I got that as the number of moles of the product. Then I use the mole ratio, which is 1 to 1, to find the moles of the chloride, so they are going to be the same moles. Since I have the number of moles of the chloride and I know its molar mass, I can be able to find the mass of the chloride. So it is the number of moles times the molar mass, and I get the mass of the chloride. The percentage by mass should be the mass of chloride over the total mass of the dried seaweed, which was this one here, times 100, and that should give me the percentage by mass, which is about 57.1%. Uh, that is two three significant figures. So this brings us to the end of question 16 as well as the end to this part of the video. Please do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.